You're listening to Force Majeure, an actual play Star Wars podcast. My name is Adam and I'm your host. And today's episode will be brought to you after these words from our sponsors. Hi everyone, my name's Robert Kerr. I'm the host and GM of the Dice and Decepticons podcast, an actual play podcast set in the Transformers universe. In Dice and Decepticons, Transformers made contact with the humans in the 1980s. Now, in the year 2005, a talented but awkward mech pilot and his team make a discovery that will put them squarely in the center of an intergalactic conflict. You can find Dice and Decepticons on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. You can also follow our Twitter, Dice Decepticons, for show notifications and updates. My name's Robert Kerr, and I'll see you next time. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this little lovely one-shot. Yes, it's another one-shot. You're sensing the theme of the whole season by this point. And this also means that I get much more chance to play with lovely new people. And some of those lovely new people aren't that new, but they're definitely lovely. I digress. Let's get things going. This is Through a Crystal Darkly, episode one. My name is Adam, and I am your GM. And I am joined around the virtual table by... I'm Ben. I'm playing Humhurst, the Duros... Doctor who also can do a little bit of piloting, but mostly is just there for helping people along with their daily uh, ponderances. I am playing... Oh, I'm Leslie. I'm just going to straighten my character. I'm (laughs) Leslie, and I'm going to be playing uh, Venla Fachin, the Balasaur survivalist. Hi, I'm Lou. I'm playing Kiki, a Gagoran stevedore. A porter, someone who carries lots of stuff. Aren't stevedores the one that have the hooks for... Yeah, that, that carry things around, that move things from ship to ship. Okay, that, very good, very good. I mean, I think I've used the right terminology. I mean, it could be entirely wrong. But who knows? Who knows? This is Star Wars. Even if you're wrong, we're making it up, so... Oh, yeah. <laughs> and before we start with our opening crawl, Ben and Leslie, do you want to tell us a little bit about where you're from and where our listeners can find more of you. We're from the Hydean Way, specifically Heroes of the Hydean Way, and we have been recently going through the long, tortured past of a Jedi named Soljo Ward and trying to figure out what the heck did this Crifhead do. A lot. And yet not as much as you'd think. Yeah, that's true. Caused a lot of chaos. Absolutely. And yeah, over the last season, we've been trying to clean up some of the mess, trying to just get to the end of the mess. Find some balance, find a foundation, all that fun stuff. Mm, yeah. And yeah, you can find us at theheidianway.com or at the Hydean Way on Twitter. I imagine by the time this episode comes out that that season will have ended. There may have been more stuff going on, but you know, even if it has ended, even the seasons have wrapped for the time being... If you've never listened to The Hiding Way, you should know by now how much we on Force Majeure love The Hiding Way. They are just the best people. And if you haven't listened to their show, you, you go, pause this, <laughs> go back, listen to at least one full season of The Hiding Way, and we'll see you in about six months' time. Welcome back. That failing, maybe pick up with one of the Varun Afa episodes, just because there's they come in small bunches rather than entire years. And Lou, you're not just on Force Majeure. Do you want to say a little bit about the other show that they can hear you on? Well, you'll hear me on some more Force Majeure. I'm going to appear on another one shot with a couple of very special guests. But I'm also on uh, Dungeon Majeure as well, where I play one of the primary characters there, Felicity, who, if you want to hear a upper class velociraptor go around having crazy hijink adventures with crabs, Dungeon Majeure is the show for you. <laughs> Yes. And if you don't think you want to hear an upper-class raptor, you're wrong. You really are. You are very, very wrong. Upper-class raptors are the best raptors. Yep. Regency era velociraptor. Hence the title for season three, Pride and Predators. Coming soon to a podcast station near you. That's awesome. Before we get going, let's roll our destiny pool. I have got two light side points. I have one light side point. 
I have two light side points. I have a dark side. You're welcome. Yeah, Adam needs one. And clearly, like, the Force <laughs> has put you in this position, but wants to see what you do. The Force is your cheerleader for this little expedition. The galaxy is full of heroes and villains and everyone in between. However, for every noble Jedi and terrifying Inquisitor, for every brave rebel and implacable Imperial, for every canny smuggler and callous crime lord, there are countless million others who are just trying to get on with their lives. Today's story focuses on just such a group of people. The crew of the long-haul freighter the Score Pigeon live quiet lives beneath the attention of the big powers of the galaxy, shipping cargo from one side of the Corellian trade spine to the other and just trying to make a living. However, while the Empire and Rebellion may not have yet have noticed them, the Force casts a wide net, and, with a sense of dramatic necessity and narrative impetus, has caught sight of the Pigeon. Are the events which are about to unfold vital for balance in the galaxy? Are the crew of the Pigeon pebbles in a pool, the ripples of which may go on to cause great things? Or was the Force merely feeling bored and fickle on this day, and wanted to see what would happen? That is beyond the scope of this humble narrator to tell, so permit me instead to say, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. We open on a planet, glittering like a jewel in the firmament. As our camera closes in, we can see why that is. As far as the eye can see, crystals shimmer and reflect the light. Great forests of crystal trees wave slowly and improbably in the breeze, and clear, pure water laps at beaches made of dazzling diamond sand. We move in closer, closer to one of those great swathes of emerald trees, where an ugly scar marks the impact site of alien artifacts, bits and pieces of starship, battered cargo pods, burning patches of starship fuel. We follow further along this trail of devastation through shattered branches and fractured boughs, until we see an escape pod, half buried from its impact into the ground, the front of the pod is buckled and broken and the hull is twisted and rent. Our camera moves through one of these holes in the superstructure and inside the pod, where dim red emergency lights flicker and alarms briefly chime out of key before croaking into silence. As our eyes adjust to the dim light, we realise that the pod is indeed occupied and starting to slowly stir and come round. We see... The door of the uh, escape pod slams open as a burly pale shoulder crunches against it and emerging out into this harsh crystal landscape is a Gagoran, seven foot tall with long pale fur that in this light looks almost blue but with charcoal streaks coming from the long head hair eyes that are almost black glitter beneath the uh, fringe of pale hair a vocoder mask covers the bottom half of their face and slung across one shoulder is a large but nondescript black bag. They pull themselves out of the escape pod and lean a huge paw down into the pod beneath them to get the next person out. Just so dangling from that immense paw would be the comfortably built but still fairly small figure of a Balasaur wearing what would best be described as layers. So, chunky, useful boots, lots of pocket-looking pants, you know. And then, if you get a good glimpse, she has probably about five shirts on, it looks like. You know, a t-shirt, a small layered shirt, a heavier layered shirt, a heavier layered shirt, and a jacket, you know. And as uh, she is lifted from the pod, her antennae poking up between uh, her swaths of dark hair are just twitching wildly. No, 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 hold on, hold on. I've got to get my, I've got to get my bag. Just, oh, just put me down. I'll get in after a second. Whomhurst, are you there? A doctor's bag gets thrown out of the hole and lands somewhere off to the side. And a greenish hand comes up to try and grab onto someone else's hand. And the sleeve that's over it is this light tan leather as... Whomhurst gets pulled out, you can see it's actually a tan leather duster, and on the back it's got this red sigil of uh, medical, emblazoned over the back, like if it was of a sufficient size that you can see this for tens of meters away, that yeah, this person is medical, and in their other hand as they come up, you can see a matching wide-brimmed hat 
that as Humhurst gets set down, the hack goes on, and it now provides shade over not just the head, but also like half the shoulders. Thank you for your help. That that was definitely something I need. Now, where did the bag go? Uh, oh, there. He picks it up. Well, your bag is over there. I've got to go get mine. Give me one second. And the Balasaur will dive head first in, kind of leaving her back half hanging out, rooting around the mayhem inside. And then another bag, worn backpack style, get chucked out. A small, uh, almost looks like it could be a flute case will end up getting chucked out. And then there's a grunt, and you hear her just kind of heave one last thing up. And then she stands up holding a relatively impressive looking weapon with a strange tube mounted under the barrel. And then she sets up to attaching all of her accoutrement. All right, I got my stuff. You got your stuff. Everybody okay? That was unpleasant. Where is the captain? Um, well, let's look for other pods, because there's lots of wreckage. Yeah, like, going from the cockpit to the escape pod, he was, like, right behind me, but I didn't... He obviously ain't here, so... Yeah, let's see if we can find him. Would you like to give us the lay of the land as we see it now? Yeah, so you're surrounded by a copse of trees, and these trees are made of glittering emerald crystal that sway in a barely perceptible breeze. The light that comes through from the sun is refracted through this kind of greenish crystal, casting strange shadows all over the place. There are a few other bits of smoke kind of just visible through the holes in the foliage from where your escape pod has crashed through. But on the whole, it's kind of a bit difficult to see You have hit what would be quite a thick copse of trees and just ploughed right through them. The front part of the escape pod has kind of buried itself into the ground. The ground is normal dirt where you are at the moment. It's just the trees and surrounding bushes and plants that appear to be made of crystal. There is a grass which is of some other form of crystal in a much lighter shade of green with hints of yellow in there as well. There are the cries of animals sounding oddly tinny kind of echoing around just starting to pick back up again as the um, the monstrous crash has faded down but in your immediate eyesight there's not really much other than your escape pod and broken bits of the ship and broken bits of the escape pod there's a smashed cargo pod about 30 foot behind you or so but again it's just kind of spilled open on impact and shattered whatever goods were in there probably droid parts and that sort of thing you weren't too sure the uh, the captain negotiated the trade you knew it was above board but other than that you didn't really dig too greatly into what is in there well then again i say that you're the, you're the cargo master aren't you leslie <laughs> i would have known what was in the boxes not necessarily all of the facets of the ordeal yeah so it looks like these ones that have come down were carrying droid and machine parts out of corellia towards the outer rim uh, along the other end of the corellian trade spine because you're right towards the end of that not too far from Terminus Station was where you were heading before whatever happened happened that caused this great catastrophe. So it was that sort of stuff that's useful out on the fringes. Useful colony spares and repairs and that sort of that, you know, evaporators parts and um, basic toolkits, that sort of stuff. Well, I don't know that we're going to get much from the crate, but is there a homing beacon? Something? how that work? There should be one of the escape pod. Whether it's working or not, you'd have to go back in and have a tinker around. Well, I can do manifests. I can't do bleepy things. Boomhurst? I can f- figure out a bit with bleepy things, but I'm more with the squishy things. But yeah, we'll try. So do you squirm your way back into the escape pod towards the flight computer and the um, homey beacons out of the front of it? Okay, yeah. I figured that there'd be like a chair that would be broken off from the bad landing. Yeah, and the front of the, the the pod has kind of crumpled in quite badly. But yeah, there is still some energy going through to the console and about two-thirds of the panels and buttons and things are still working on there. All right. I'll see if I can see the, the emergency radios up and the emergency beacon, which may be the same thing, but... Yeah. It looks like the circuitry that wires into them is damage from the impact well, it shouldn't be too complicated to repair these things are built to survive a crash and be easily fixed you know there's multiple layers of redundancy in there 
I think I'd like either a mechanics or a slicing test to purple and a setback for the damage. Okay, two purple, and I would like to use a light side point. By all means, look a light side point. Okay, well, since we have five, I'm sort of figuring, why not? Yeah, seems rude not to. I might not go quite that far, but... And I have one success, one advantage off of the roll. Okay. You must repair enough of it that you can get the emergency, I suppose like the black box and emergency computer section working again. There are no other beacons in this area being kicked off from the score pigeon. So either any other escape pods have landed out of range of where you are, or they haven't landed at all. The homing beacon on the on your escape pod, however, is now functional, and you can certainly turn that on if you want. I think I've got no reason not to turn it on. Yeah. And what would you like for your advantage? I'm kind of at a loss. It's only one advantage. If anyone else has suggestions. I mean, you're sending out a, a kind of a radio sweep, I suppose. Would you like to see if there's any other radio signals in the area that it might be able to pick up that aren't specifically your escape pod frequencies? Yeah, that sounds good. There is. He says, what a leading question. <laughs> How convenient. There is a very, very faint, extremely old homing you know, emergency signal coming from maybe a couple of miles away. It's certainly not from your ship, but there is another signal out there. It is sufficiently old and degraded that you can't really get any details about who or what's sending the signal out. But there is a very, very faint degraded signal out there. So Hoomer still clamber out, using the broken chair as a step to get out, yanking themselves out. Well, doesn't look like there's anyone else out there, at least from our ship. The beacon's back on, but off in that direction, there is another beacon. It seems kind of old, though, so... I don't, it doesn't, it ain't from our ship, but it could be from a ship, or maybe it's something else. But it's about the only thing that, like, the scanners are shot, the radio's working and got us at, but otherwise not much. And, yeah, I'm not seeing any other escape pods. I really don't want to think about how that's going to end up. Uh Uh-oh. Well, maybe we just got kind of bumped away from the main group. Maybe maybe they'll 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 get the, the beep and they'll be able to find us. But you said there's another signal. Yes, off in that direction. Okay, okay. And from what I know of the cargo behind us, it's just mechanical stuff. There's it's like it was a box with more boxes of stuff. Yeah. Okay, so it wasn't even like it would have other supplies or anything in it. No, it doesn't look like it was any of the ones that might have had food or potables. I will flip a destiny point if you think this is necessary, but I want this uh, escape pod to function kind of as Venla's vacation pod. Like, she doesn't go on vacation, but she periodically will disappear for a fishing trip. Yeah. So I basically want to have just one of those little rolly carts with a couple of, like, a little bit of rations and and basic supplies. Yeah, I'll allow that. Okay. No need to flip for that. That seems fair. It's one of those foldable... Rolly, or I guess it might be hover because it's Star Wars, <laughs> but it's it's got a cloth body and just that L shape, so it's got stuff in it. And she will hang her heavy gun on top of that pack. I guess we should head that way, right? Seems like a thing. Well, I don't think we should stay here. There doesn't seem to be anything here. It's really interesting, though. I mean, I've never seen. She's going to kind of wander off to look at some of the plant life. Not very far, just a couple of steps, like kneel down, feel the grass, look at some of the leaves. You say it's crystalline, but is it, like, hard? Yep. So, like, when the wind blows, it goes... Ching, 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 like, yeah, it chimes. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. It's very pretty. She's going to pocket a couple of different samples, just out of curiosity. Do they look like any familiar shapes we would have seen before? Like, is it an oak? that has been crystallized or some of them have that sort of analog the leaf patterns of other no totally new to you yeah definitely stealing a bunch of like filling some pockets with leaves because while you're looking around kind of having broken off and, and are engaged in looking at the foliage you catch from the corner of your eye 
a few trees away. Movement in the upper branches. She's going to hold one hand up, like, not like the closed fist, like, military, but just kind of like, hey, and do a a round with the finger to kind of get their attention and point in that direction. But she is going to go very still otherwise. In the upper branches of that tree are what... The best way to describe them are a group of six-limbed squirrel analogues, also made of crystal. Their crystal fur, if I can use that phrase, is a kind of a, a wood-brown colour that again is catches the light that come through and semi-translucent. And as the light as the light basically gets greenified as it comes through the upper leaves and shines on them, their brownish fur starts taking on the colour of the leaves around them. So it's only in the patches where the light is coming through unfiltered by the tree, by, by the leaves, that you can see their wood brown coloration. They are about the size of a large house cat. There are four or five of them, and they are all very still, just watching you. Do they look like they're just watching us? Yeah. They don't appear to be predatory in their mien. You know, they, they appear more curious than anything else. No, we don't have any uh, rations to spare a test run on, so uh, she's just going to kind of rise to her, her feet all the way and back back toward the group. I think we should keep moving, but pay attention. You can't trust anything that shape. And then she'll double check with whom hers for the direction and shrug like, I guess we go. You head off into the crystal forest. That away. Onward. Can I please get a survival test? It is going to be three purple is your difficulty with an additional setback for it being just such an alien environment. Is this a combined one? You can do it as a combined check. I'm more than happy with that. Yes, I'm figuring someone has a better cunning than two. And I have no ranks. Yes, you could say that. Yeah, I was going to say, this wasn't going to be one for me. <laughs> Just looking to see if I have anything that is specifically survival. We're not chasing anything and we're not trying to be sneaky, so it's just going to be straight up survival. I guess we're not trying to be sneaky away from the squirrels. To be honest, I'm not entirely certain I've realized that the squirrels are there. I'm too distracted by the bright, pretty colors in the crystal trees. <laughs> That is a lot of advantage. Wow. So out of one yellow, four green, three purple, and a black, four advantage. But no successes. Not a blessed one. But but no failures either, so it could have been worse. Yeah. yeah. So, do you want to give us context, or shall I spend my advantage before? I'll give you some context. You head off into the crystalline forest which gets thicker and thicker until it's almost like a crystalline jungle by this point. There's a lot more creeper analogues and uh, vine analogues that start manifesting. Um, were you asking me to pause or were you just high-fiving me? Sorry, my, my brain's <laughs> functioning. Was this a check to move through things? Yes, it was, yes. And kind of head I, got a, I got a success then because I get to remove a oh. setback for traveling through terrain or managing environmental effects. Aha! Yes, sorry, in which case a success and an event. Okay, so yeah, you, you head off. Um, under here, the light is a lot more tightly focused coming through the leaves, and it's getting warmer and warmer and quite humid. You're not sure where the water, like the, the water for the humidity is coming from because you've not yet come across any water sources particularly but it is definitely getting a bit stickier and and just very oppressively hot as the light is being reflected and focused down around here. You come across a trail and manage to stop yourself with, with your success just as a rumble in the ground. You know, you, you can feel something big is approaching. Looks like the path it's traveling is gonna cut directly across you, kind of across your direction of travel but you do manage to catch yourself uh, and pick up these vibrations before whatever it is makes an appearance onto the scene. Okay, so I think what happens is as they get, she actually will have taken the lead because this is kind of her jam. As things got really hot, she took off the jacket, took off a layer, put the jacket back on. The layer is now added to the bag of stuff. But um, she pauses right on the edge of that trail you saw, or you mentioned, because 
at that point there would be some sign of traffic going through there, so there would be more broken limbs or just even little signs. And she just has everybody hang back a moment, and then she says, you know, kind of get down. And then she looks at Kiki and gets further down. Practically laying flat. And then she's like, shh. Actually, Kiki's got to look lovely. Because Kiki's a, a Gigeron and they're, they're, they're white, right? Yeah. So she looks like a disco ball party right now. Absolutely. Prismatic Yeti. Prismatic Yeti, but it's clearly, you know, not doing well in the heat. Because, you know, it's a Yeti and it's hot and I'm not good in the hot. We'll figure this out for you. So we kind of quieten ourselves back, but I'd like for at least two of my advantage to have a good view of what I can see, and then I don't know how much else you'd want for that. I'm happy for you to maybe spend the other two advantage to negate any need for a stealth roll or anything as you you find a good vantage point to see what's coming without... I like that idea. I like that idea a lot. Uh, Maybe... Maybe I get them down, but I find like a tree to perch in so I can still see all the way around. But we're, we're all well secreted. Yeah. So yeah, you, you clamber up one of these trees. The trees are very slightly warm to the touch, despite being crystalline. But maybe that's because they're holding the light, perhaps, and kind of get up to... They are very tough. They hold your weight easily, despite looking quite fragile and glass-like. And what you see cutting through the underbrush ahead of you. It's a rhythmic kind of thumping pattern. And after a few seconds, you realize that whatever it is, is leaping up out of the ground, then plunging back down into the ground, then burrowing a bit further, and then leaping up and down in quite a sinuous movement pattern. The closest analog is a barracuda a barracuda the size of an X-Wing. This thing is massive. It is beautiful, though. Its scales are, again, it's all interlocking crystal fragments of blues and greens and yellows, turning to kind of a, a, an umber colour around the belly of it, which glitter and burst with light as it erupts. As it hits the peak of each jump, it seems to suck in the light and then it goes back down again and then up it has massive jaws with big translucent white teeth but even they don't appear to be necessarily for biting anything because it it opens its mouth wide and again seems to be swallowing the sunlight before bursting back down it has a thick ridge of stone across its, its nose and up to the top of its head which seems to be what it's using to burrow back down into the ground and then out again so that it doesn't fracture as it hits the soil. And then after about 10 minutes of progress, it disappears out of sight. From your vantage point up the tree, Leslie, what you also see is about half a mile away, there is another clearing. It doesn't appear to have been smashed into by any particular falling debris, but it is the first actual open space in the canopy that you've seen since you started moving. Okay, so first of all, she is kind of in love because that was really neat, but also really, really terrifying because I am not the size of an X-Wing. Even Kiki is not the size of an X-Wing. We are um, piffling in comparison. So she'll swing her way down back to the team. We should be careful. I think um, just... I don't know if, if you saw that, but um, we, sh- we should watch and be careful. Uh, what direction should we be going in again? The clearing is not quite on the path that Hoomhurst angled you down, but it's in that rough direction. Okay. Yeah, we, we should be going in that direction, but I don't know. That's, that's away from where that crate just went. That was a crate, wasn't it? near as I've ever seen. Oh, wow. If I could get the rod out and just... I could sit here and fish for years. Never see something like that again. Or actually here, I might see a lot like that. She pats the little flute-looking case that she has attached to her thigh thoughtfully, but no, 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 no. We should keep moving. If we can keep our bearings, maybe we should take a break in that clearing, though. She kind of looks at Kiki. Just to catch our breath. It's been a long day. 
kiki nuts. Yeah, let us do. On that front, um, is the daylight changing as we travel? Is this just all the sun all the time, or is there a night cycle that looks like it's on its way? There does appear to be a night cycle on its way, yeah. Okay. You couldn't swear to how long the day-night cycle is here. You've not really been here long enough, but there is a clear day-night cycle. The sun is moving in the sky. Okay. Would it make sense to get to there and break, or is night further feeling away? Yeah, night is further feeling away. Okay. As a rough guess, you're probably mid-morning-ish in the the day-night cycle. The, The sun is still rising. We should probably still take a break, I think, just to, to keep our wits about us, and we'll, we'll find a way to mark so that we know which way we're going. And thusly, we continue. Mm-hmm. Still stealing bits and bobs of leaves and twigs as I can. Not stealing, collecting. Yeah, collecting. You head further through the crystalline jungle. There are calls of birds now, strange and alien birds, and occasionally you can see the flickers of movement as they fly from you know parts of the canopy to parts of the canopy they look almost more like bats in the way that their wings are shaped but have the coloration of parrots and again with like a deep reds and blues again made of crystal again semi-translucent as they flitter about you see a few more of the squirrel analogs two of them appear to have been keeping pace with you since you left your ship with a definite curiosity as they kind of scamper and follow you they went very very still when whatever that big barracuda thing was went past but again i've started kind of following you as a respectable distance and you're getting close to the outskirts of this clearing and i would like either a group survival or a group perception test please or i suppose a group vigilance one of the three whichever one you're happy you're doing as a as a team i mean i contribute to green no matter which skill you just mentioned Vigilance, I can contribute a le- yellow to it, but yeah, I am not a good knower. I have a two yellow and three green in perception, but if we want to play Vigilance, I had two boost, but I only have one will, which is why she asks a lot of questions. <laughs> will it change the kind of information we get? Yes. Hmm. Well, I'm not telling you to what. <laughs> I kind of think perception makes the most sense if we're doing it as a group, just because we're all kind of being, well, to our different varying levels, being aware of our surroundings. Yes, my two green aware of our surroundings. It's very pretty and very warm. That's about what I can give you. (laughs) Well, a fact per green, that's fair. So that's going to be a three purple test. I will give you a boost for the assistance of the rest of the team. And there is going to be a setback in there as well, which relates to, again, it being such an alien environment. Okay, I don't think I actually get to remove anything for that. I just wanted to check so I didn't do it after the fact this time. Yeah. Well. Well. (laughs) Okay, that's somewhat of D1 trying to make up. I was going to say, that's that's a different result, isn't it? Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So out of that roll, we ended up with eight successes, but one threat. Okay. I'm going to inflict a strain for the threat. Seems fair. From the heat. I'll take off the jacket, take another one of the extra shirts on, put the jacket back on. So, this clearing is not empty. It is a wide open space where there are no trees, but there are a number of things that you can immediately spy out, and from a good enough distance that you can choose how to how to interact with these. In the trees, in the direction that you're travelling, there are three very large arachnid analogues. They are the same colour green as the leaves that they're hiding in. They are huge, however, but the way that the light reflects on their carapace and the way that their carapace is um, faceted means it looks like their butt is a bough of a tree and an outcropping of branches. You know, it's that it's that same kind of spread uh, and the way it reflects the light makes it look like they are leaves and it's just another branch. They have spread between a number of the trees, kind of almost blocking off that pathway. Very, very fine crystalline threads forming webs. In the center of the clearing, there is a pitcher plant. It is about eight foot tall and quite wide. Girthy, I want to say. Girthy, which is a very, very deep green. I wish I knew more colors of green. You know, I don't really see colours. You'll have to bear with me on this one. It's a very, very deep 
kind of a murky sea green almost. However, there is a patterning on the front of it that is vaguely humanoid. If you squinted, I mean really, really squinted, kind of looks like an orange Twi'lek shape. Or maybe a Togruton. There is definite kind of stylized bits that could be head tails of some form. Maybe that's Montrals at the top, or maybe it's it's a hat. But it's like a an abstract silhouette in shade, like in colour patterns, on the front of this pitcher plant. The pitcher plant is about three quarters turned away, so you can kind of pick up this thing, my Bob. And the, the lid of the pitcher plant, which is opening and closing occasionally, snapping at insects, is shouting at the spiders in very old but understandable trader Kent. Go away, spiders! Go away! These are my insects. Nothing for you. Nothing for you. Go away! I've told you once. Almost like you don't understand the common tongue. Outrageous! Mm. And then the pitcher plan pushes itself up on some of its tendrils and shuffles kind of to a different angle and brandishes one of its leaves at the spiders. Carries on shouting. Venla, the plant is talking. The plant is talking. And is it wearing a twilight scarf? Yeah, it might be. And Humhurst then inspects all of the different vials that he has to make sure that all of them are still intact. Yeah, it does seem to be that way. Uh, this is... I have not seen any of the things like this sober. <laughs> I, I... We could... If we stay over here, keep very still and quiet, we could probably catch a bit of a, a respite. And then we should press on. I don't feel like we should interact with them any more than we might have to. Because I think the screaming plant could eat Kiki whole. Plants don't eat people. <laughs> uh, Venla will actually give kind of a, a pitying laugh like, yes, they do. <laughs> but she won't say that. I'm just saying, it could. And that probably wouldn't come out of your fur. <laughs> so let's just sit here and breathe a moment and then get back in the forest. Okay. Are the, the squirrels anywhere near us? Can we see them? Uh, they have moved further back. The shouting of the pitcher plant has clearly unnerved them a little and they've, they've moved further back. They're still kind of roughly in, in eyesight. But. Okay. Venla is going to try and position herself so that she can look at her, her comrades so they we can all kind of sit sit and have a break together and be a team, but also so she can see the pitcher plant, also so she can see the pitcher plant and the spiders and be aware of the, I'm going to call them monkeys, at least once. <laughs> 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 when you started talking, like, if he says monkeys, we're going to have words, but <laughs> be aware of the squirrels, at least once, you know have that in the back of my brain. I assume it's a little less oppressive here. Yes, it is, yeah. And there is a breeze that's coming down through the open canopy, which cools things off quite nicely. Still no sign of any water or any living things that aren't crystalline-based, but at least there's a breeze. Does Kiki look a little happier? Yeah, very much so. And he's just so probably laying down like a dog in the heat, you know. Vokoda mask has come off, you know, briefly... So you can pant a little bit, try and get rid of some of the excess body heat while we're just resting and don't actually need to talk. But yeah, if you don't make your presence known beyond that point and stay at, at the outskirts, the pitcher plant does not clock you. It carries on shouting at the spiders and exits the scene following a brief display where it, it walks close to the spiders, the spiders kind of hiss and start raising up, and then it vomits out a jet of a high propulsive acid that spatters against one of the spiders and then the spiders flee as the branches they were on gently simmer and steam and slowly start to melt underneath this acid like melting glass it's very Escher as the branches kind of slowly pull down and the plant goes yes, yes, told you this is my grove I died here and there were a lot of bloody spiders around here and then it settles back into the middle of the grove lowers itself back down on its tendrils, settles itself in. It's still got its back to you and just opens its mouth and is occasionally just snapping at, its, uh, at some insects. This grove, kind of the central of it, have lots of... They're about bumblebee-sized 
flying critters that again are made of, of a deep kind of purple amethyst crystal that are flying around on some of the, the ground level plants uh, and flitting around through this, this open canopy like a swarm and it's just occasionally quite pleasantly snapping at some of these we can understand it right yeah oh yeah okay do we want to attempt to talk to it did, did you hear it say it died here yeah but maybe like someone fell into the plant or the plant ate someone and they got their memories and we could like talk to the uh, ghost uh-huh. I mean it doesn't seem like it's a random real estate developer but who knows uh, I, I don't I don't I don't know but she really really wants to you can see that I think if a plant speaks you should talk to it you don't see that every day do we want to talk to the plant? I mean, it's sentient, clearly, sapient. It's having... A, I wouldn't say it's having a conversation with those spiders. It's spewing acid at those spiders, which I suppose is a reason not to talk to it. But she is is going to stand and look at her compatriots. Like, do you want to do this? Kiki will get up and walk into the grove. <laughs> Kiki's yeah. like, let's just do it. Okay. Whomhurst will get up and follow, making sure that the hat is in proper position and the coat is, and will take one of their stems and uh, start twirling it between their fingers. Venla will follow. She's still bringing her little hover cart of, of goodies. The breeze feels nice, and she's really, really scared and interested and also distracted by bumblebees. <laughs> you enter the grove, and your entrance causes the insect swarm to dissipate and that catches the attention of this plant which raises itself up on its tendril feet and shuffles round to face you Hello, I'm Kiki, who are you? Ah, I am the Jedi Knight Hoculum Preb Servant of the Republic Welcome to wherever we are You appear to be real people is that a is that a thing still? We yes. Uh, yeah. What? Well, at least when I'm sober. Just about half the time, probably. The important yeah, parts. About that. Yeah, sure. We can go with that. <laughs> Apparently sober. Well. Hot kill him. Where did all the bees go? Oh, they were scared away. They're not used to real people. And I ate a lot of them. Sorry about that. It's all right. They'll they'll come back. That's why I stay here. Uh, I can't eat enough of the uh, the other creatures. And ever since I ate myself, it's been dashedly hard getting enough sustenance. You seem confused there. You... okay. So you're you're not real, but we are. I mean, not anymore. I was, briefly, and then, uh, then I ate myself. But that's... that's not normal, right? Right? I mean, that's not normal. No. I mean, look around you. The frame for what is normal on this planet is skewed from, from what I grew up with in Coruscant. Is the Republic still a thing? No, we are well into the Empire. This is standard Star Wars timeline for the games, so we are in between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. Mm. Ah, Coruscant. I miss it. It glitters like the moonlight through these dashed trees. I fear I'll never go back. Not as I am now. It's a place for real people. Not forgotten ghosts like I am. Or mobile, carnivorous plants like I also am. It's very difficult trying to reconcile the different facets. But I suppose the benefit of being on a planet made of crystal is that everything is facets. I've been thinking about that one for about four decades. I'm very proud of it. Very hard to get philosophical conversation when everything else is, you know... Not real. And the pitcher plant kind of furrows its lid as if trying to furrow eyebrows. Because, of course, when it's talking, it it is flapping its big kind of a... It's essentially a talking trash can. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I want to stick googly eyes on it. Uh, I've introduced myself. Who are you, Wanderers? And how are you here? Well, uh, we we crashed here, and I'm Homehurst. Nice to meet you. Crash does seem to be the most common way of arriving here. Similar thing happened to me in the Oka Wanderer. Wherever that is. Was it a bad crash? I mean, is there such a thing as a good crash? 
Well, good crash, your ship can get up and go again. Our escape pod couldn't. Ah, in which case it was a good crash. Ah. Probably. Should still work. Not really an engineer, it was. Um, hmm. Not quite sure how long ago it was. A while. Definitely a while. I have definitely been dead longer than I haven't been at this point. Which, when you consider it, is quite a depressing prospect. Have any of you been dead for longer than you've been alive? I don't think you're dead. I think you're differently alive. It raises one of its leaves, which it then kind of curls the crystal round, as if wagging a finger in the air. Excellent point. (laughs) <laughs> it is so nice to have philosophers here again. Yes, I suppose technically I am still alive, just corporeally relocated. Yes, something like that anyway. And who are you? He waves the leaf towards you, Kiki. I, I, I'm Kiki, I said. You did? Yes. Yes, that happened. <laughs> it's hard to always remember what really happens. I've been along so long that the mind and it curls one of its leaves around the side of, of the, the, the torso of the plant as if to gesticulating where its head would be the mind wanders you know like the bees just so like the bees so if you're not real mm. and we are yes are all of the crystal things not real because the acid at the spider seemed awfully Real. No, I mean, obviously the acid was real. Um, I suppose it, uh, it, it, it's all about how you, you perceive real. I personally think that everything that isn't you being definably meat is probably just a very elaborate hologram caused by the light bouncing off all of these crystals, you see. It's improbable to otherwise believe that life can exist in such a... a, a um, um, and, and again, it kind of moves its its leaf around in a circular motion as it's trying to search for the word. Demi-organic form, I suppose? Crystalline, anyway. Not meat. Not meat form. Okay. It's a hard existence being an elaborate hologram. If that is your experience, I believe you. Um, your ship. That is a good crash. Yes. Would you mind being that you are no longer real if we as definably meet were to use it of course not on one condition I was on my way to deliver a very very important message to the Jedi Council and I need to make sure that you can deliver that message for me because I think if I go back there as I am now and it waves its leaves up and down itself to gesticulate at its its pitcher plant form it might cause panic. A bit of a stir, maybe. Yes, not always the most accepting people, the Jedi Council. I mean, obviously, they're very, very wise people to have got there in the first place. And, of course, they taught me, and, and my master is now on the council, and they were just lovely, just the loveliest people. Little furry thing. Looked like a child's toy. Shark eyes, though. They eat people, so I've been told. But these days, who am I to judge? I probably would eat people. I, I, I eat anything. I eat me. Obviously, that's how I came to be here. At I eat people, or I would eat people, Venma looks over <laughs> at Kiki <laughs> and kind of waggles her antennae like, huh? Umaris is taking a single step back. <laughs> I'm not going to eat you, because then I'd get terribly crowded, you see. I think you're... You, you're not Jedi, are you? I think that's what happened, you see. Uh... I don't think I am. Huh. Might be all right, then. Don't really want to risk it, though. It's already crowded enough in here with just me. Oh. Didn't think that one through, did you? And it curls its leaf up and wraps on, on the side of itself, <laughs> letting out a tinkling kind of glass-on-glass sound. Turning back to Kiki again. Good call. Good call. Kiki nods, knowingly, not entirely certain what they're nodding to, but but it's, it's pleased for the praise regardless. Mm-hmm. Is the message something you need to tell us or something at the ship, and where is a council? The council are, 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 are the Jedi Temple on Coruscant, uh, obviously. That's 
unless it relocated, it might have relocated. That's the last place I knew, but I'm pretty sure if you go to Coruscant and ask where the Jedi Council is, anyone there will be able to tell you. Uh, the message is contained within, uh, we call it a holocron, which is different to a hologram, like I currently probably am, in that it's a, well then again, given that a holocron also contains the memories of a, of a dead Jedi, maybe I'm not that, I could be a living holocron, imagine that. I'd be the talk of the town. I'll have to come with you. No, wait, cause mm, we've got a war. I'll have to ponder about my status and whether or not I actually want to stay here. I'm a bit worried that if I go back there, the temptation to devour most of the city might overcome me and I wouldn't want to be accused of being gauche. Mm, not, not I, not Hoculum Preb. Uh, I was known for my suavity. But yes, it's a holocron uh, that I, I, I located. Uh, from a deceased master, and it just needs kind of giving back, as it were, just giving back with a message to say, sorry, he's dead. They'll understand. Records. A lot of, a lot of records in the Jedi Council. Love it. Whole, like, catacombs full of flimsy plast and archives and the like. Never really that into that. I was a Togruter of action. So should we tell them you're dead? Or... Do you want to become a holocron? I have to ponder that in the walk back to the ship. We have got a little bit to go, so, um, how about you fall in? And I'll take you there, avoiding all these spiders. We don't want any more of them. They definitely will eat you. Hmm. And it, it wrinkles its trunk a little bit, round about where the face of this stylized togruta esque pattern was, as if the face was trying to wrinkle its nose but can't because it's a crystalline plant. Mm. I suppose that would complicate matters. Is the direction we're being told is the ship, is that the way we were headed? Yes, it is, yes. All right. Onwards, then! And it raises itself up on its little feet, and it very, very slowly starts shuffling off into the jungle. Benla's going to drop back and talk to her good doctor friend real quick. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that I don't keep up on current events, but... Did any of that make sense to you? Uh, they sound really, really old. Okay. I got that from the four decades. Because, I mean, mm. pff, old. Yeah, the rest of it kind of makes a bit of sense, but a little bit. Like, is that still a thing? I don't think so, but do you think it's a good idea to let a plant that can shoot acid know that bad things have happened? <sighs> to the council that they're wanting to? I'm a little worried about... They then thinking that we're just food. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we have to, we will explain gently, preferably from behind something acid proof. That seems reasonable. You feeling any better, Kiki? Oh, yeah. Much better. Okay. I found a plant friend. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. So I guess we, we follow, because I can't imagine it takes much to catch up. Because he's a waddling pitcher plant. Nope. No, it does not. And I think as you follow uh, the, the pitcher plant that thinks it's the Jedi Knight Hoculum Prev into the jungle, our camera pulls back through the canopy, through the glittering prism that is the forest that you're walking through, back further into space, just the glittering world highlighted. And that is where we're ending the episode for this week. But wait! Before we leave you, this episode's patron is ACJ. AC has been a member of the Force Majeure Discord hype squad for some time and is doing sterling work in that role, keeping us smiling when we need that little boost. In fact, taking this opportunity to steal a little bit of AC's thunder, so I'm sorry about that and hope you can forgive me. I also want to shout out as part of this to the rest of the Discord hype squad, you know who you are, to all of our listeners, all of our fans, everyone who interacts with us and keeps us going, everyone who listens to the show and reaches out and lets us know that we're keeping you entertained, because that little boost to our spirits means an awful lot, especially in the times we live in right now. Knowing that you're listening, that you're enjoying what we're doing, uh, and hearing from you especially, is something that really does mean a lot. So thank you very much to everyone who does. I'm not going to name names because I will doubtless forget someone and I don't want to cause offence because it is too hot for my brain to work properly remembering names. You are all very much beloved. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
And thank you generally to everyone that's listening to this and putting up with my rambling. Look after yourselves, my lovelies. Remain delightful. And we will see you next time. Force Majeure is played using the Star Wars Force and Destiny game system by Fantasy Flight Games and Lucas Books. Our intro music for this season is Unholy Night by Kevin MacLeod, and our outro music remains Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale, both used with gratitude under the Creative Commons license. If you like the show and want to interact with us, we are on Twitter, we are on Facebook, we are on Instagram, all of which are at Force Majeure Pod though Twitter is probably where you're going to find us more regularly. If you enjoy what we do and want to support the show, there's three ways you can do that. The first is via our Patreon at patreon.com slash force majeure pod. The second is by buying us a coffee at ko-fi.com slash force majeure pod. And the third way is by rating and reviewing us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, anywhere where you can find us. We really like reviews. It tells us that we're telling the stories that you want to hear and helps other people find us. Thank you very much for listening. We'll see you next time.